Let's all be standing, if you will. Take an opportunity to shake hands, fellowship with one another as we worship this morning. All throughout my history, your faithfulness is walked beside me. The winter storm make way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. This morning, who would have a spoken request? I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurt, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation. I'll pray this for you. I pray for your healing. The circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee. In Jesus' name, I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life. 
so grateful that we can cry out to you, God, that we have a God who hears us and not just hears but cares, and then a God who is sovereign and can do something about those things. I pray right now for someone who needs their brothers and sisters to pray for them this morning. I pray that you will give courage for them to ask, and I pray that as your word is proclaimed this morning that we will be changed, that we will seek your presence, that we will know that we have the authority given by you to cry out to you in your name and to pray these things over people's lives and over our own lives, asking in your name for your healing. And maybe that won't look like what we want it to, but it'll look like what you want it to. And we're grateful for that this morning. Amen. Man, if you have your Bibles this morning, open to the Gospel of John chapter 11. Uh, I, like most of you, probably uh, have had lots of relationships in my life. And I'm assuming that everybody at some point has had relationships. Uh, and that goes all the way back to when I was little. Uh, you remember some of your childhood relationships? Uh, I thought it was odd. Uh, you know, I was just thinking about a guy I grew up with uh, just a week or so ago. And uh, I don't know why he came to my mind, but as I was walking around on campus, I think on uh, last Tuesday, not this Tuesday, but the Tuesday before, uh, this lady stopped me in the hallway that I didn't know, and she's like, hey, can I ask you a weird question? I'm like, sure. I mean, what could go wrong with that, right? She's like, where did you go to junior, or where did you go to junior high school? And I'm like, North. Anybody else go to North? North Tigers? No? A couple of you? Okay, so a couple of us went, went to the cool school in Waverly, and so uh, went to North, and she's like... You went to school with my husband. So I'm like, who's your husband? And she told me his name. And, and when I heard that name, I'm like, man, I haven't heard that name for 37 years. Hard to believe it's been that long. So you, you built relationships in childhood uh, that didn't last very long for the most part. I've always said, you know, growing up in Waverly and the generation I grew up in, since I went to North, I mean, knowing someone who went to West or East was like 
knowing someone who lived in Columbus at that date stage of your life because it was just geographically, you know, we kids on the hill. We didn't really know Heights kids or Estates kids and stuff like that. Poor Danny out in Prosperity. He had like, what, one friend? I mean, there's no one out there. Uh, and so that's kind of the way it was. But we built, we built childhood relationships. Childhood relationships kind of grow. I remember when I graduated from high school, went in the military, built different relationships, new relationships with people around me uh, that were my friends in the military. Those relationships were strong, uh, but probably not as strong as the relationships I would build after that. When I came back, went to college, built relationships with you know college friends and in my early adult life, built relationships with other people, probably just like all of you, built relationships with different people throughout the course of your life. But as my life, as I grew up, my life changed. There was one relationship that really never kind of drifted apart. Childhood friends, college friends, military friends drifted apart. But there was one relationship that we never really drifted apart. And that was my relationship with Rhonda. And so throughout high school, throughout college, throughout, you know, post-college, our relationship never really drifted apart. And we finally embarked upon this stage of relationship that we call engagement. Y'all know what engagement is, right? Engagement is that stage of relationship where things are progressing beyond the casual and the comfortable. We're moving into this stage of relationship that, you know, spiritually with Jesus, we call it intimacy. And we talk about that at Buchanan, how important intimacy is. Engagement is that stage in a relationship when you are moving towards intimacy and that relationship is taking on something different than it ever has been before. Engagement is where you're committing relationally and, and uh, personally in a way that you never have before. You'll get that, right? So, so this engagement in a relationship is a new stage of life. we got a couple, couple couples here at Buchanan that are currently in that stage of life where you're building, listen closely to this, you're building <laughs> towards intimacy where you're, you're connecting in a way that you've never connected before that someday is going to blossom into a marriage relationship. So we get that. Now spiritually, that's the way it works as well too. So you'll know we're the bride of Christ. So we're just supposed to be engaged to Christ. I mean, that's kind of our spiritual life. So what we've looked at over the last couple of weeks is this journey that we take spiritually as we maybe, you know, kind of have an encounter with Jesus. Maybe we connect with Jesus. But at this point, what we're talking about is a full-blown engagement with Jesus where we are more, we are more emotionally connected to him, more relationally connected to him than we ever have been before. And that creates a new dynamic in our spiritual lives that I don't know a lot of Christians get to this side of eternity. I'm not saying they won't get there, just don't know that they get to it this side of eternity. And that is this stage of engagement where I'm connected with Jesus relationally and that takes on a whole other aspect than what we generally see in our Christian walk. That's what we want to get to this morning. So I'm going to read a little bit of scripture and then we're going to pray. We're going to get through all this scripture this morning before we leave in John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother, uh, this Mary whose brother Lazarus was now sick was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So John gives us that clarifying detail. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick, which is kind of an odd turn of phrase. If you know anything about the Gospel of John, who does John typically identify as the person Jesus loved? He generally calls himself that, the disciple whom Jesus loved. But here, here's an odd turn of phrase that, that his sisters use when they write to Jesus and say, Lord, the one that you love is sick. Now, do you believe that's true about Lazarus and Jesus? Do you really think that they've got this relationship where, where they can say to Jesus, Lord, the one that you love is sick, and he's immediately going to know who that is? I think so. And so that's the message they send to him. So when Jesus heard this in verse 4, there's some odd things going on in here. And there are a couple things I really want to point out to you that Jesus says that I think we tend to overlook in the whole Lazarus experience. So when, 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 and when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. 
Well, we all know how it ends, right? So knowing like three or four verses ahead, we kind of think, well, no, Jesus, it is going to end in death, but that's not the end end of the story. That's just how we see physical life. So Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. And again, it's odd because like for five verses later, they're going to talk about Lazarus again and, and, and Jesus is going to say, Lazarus is dead. So I'm not connecting here how you say that it's not going to end in death, but it is going to end in death. So that's kind of where we're at at this point. Uh, the sickness will not end in death. Look at what he says. And this is important. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. So everything that happens in this account, one objective, God's glory. Your life, one objective, God's glory. That's why you were created. And so when you understand that, now it puts life in perspective differently than the way we traditionally see it. Because when we think, I was created for God's glory, it ought to change my perspective, uh, perspective on how I view the world. Look, when you understand you were created for God's glory, it should change your perspective on politics, which is such a hot-button issue today. When you understand that you were created for God's glory, should change your perspective on marriage, should change your perspective on your involvement in the church. When you understand that you were created for God's glory, it should move you away from the self-centered lives we tend to live in America towards a Christ-centered life that glorifies Him. But I don't know, again, I don't know that we really get to that point in American culture, do we? Where we move to a Christ-centered life where God's objective is to be glorified in me? Or do we kind of always, always shift towards a self-centered existence where my objective is to glorify myself in everything I do? That's what we see so much of. So this is uh, so that God can get glorified. Now look at verse 5. Uh, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So Jesus loves them. No doubt about that. So everybody's clear with the fact that Jesus loves them. And so what did Jesus do when he heard that Lazarus was sick, when he knew that he loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha? What did he do when he heard Lazarus was sick? Well, obviously, being the good God that he is, he just immediately dropped everything and went to heal Lazarus, right? No. When Jesus heard that uh, Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Isn't it just perplexing on every level for us as humans to think that God knows my problem, God has the ability to deal with my problem, and yet rather than move when I think he ought to move, he just decides to stay away two more days. That does not mesh with the way we perceive reality, does it? Because we kind of think God got a need, uh, here it is. Or to quote Vanilla Ice, if there's a problem, you will solve it. Yeah, that's what God ought to be doing, right? That's a terrible quote for a Sunday morning. It was the best I could do at that point. But that's what we think about God, right? God got a need. You need to move. Get this taken care of because I don't want... Look, who wants to die, right? Nobody wants to die. Lazarus probably doesn't want to go through the physical process of death. Should Mary and Martha have to go through the grieving process of death? Look, what I see is a win-win for everybody. Jesus, go heal him. Everybody knows you can heal him. And it's a win-win, right? makes so much sense in our minds, but yet there's something about a relationship with Jesus where we're relationally connected, where we have an opportunity to see God's glory demonstrated in a crazy way. And that's what Mary and Martha and Lazarus are going to get to experience. It's what we ought to get to experience. Bow your heads with me. Father, I want to thank you for this day and for uh, coming together on a Sunday morning. I want to thank you uh, for our work morning we just as we worship we're kind of thinking about what, what great power you have as we, as we sang that song uh, what we know is that we can just speak your name and when we speak your name there is power that is released in the very name of Jesus that has the ability to transform lives to bring healing to the sick to do incredible things and yet uh, most of us will speak your name and, and never see anything really radical like that going on uh, and so what we want to do, Father, is kind of engage in a relationship with you where we're comfortable and confident with what you're doing, not just in our lives, but in the lives of the people around us, that we can have the boldness to speak your name with authority and power and know that when we did it, you would do supernatural things in the lives of the people around us because that's what people need. Uh, we, we've got uh, friends and family that are lost. They, they don't know you. 
and, and what they need is supernatural victory in their lives. Father, help us to see that when we connect with you really in this, in this engaged level of commitment, we can see and do, well, according to your words, greater things than you did. And so that's what we want this morning, Father, is to reach that level of relationship where we see and do greater things than you did, all because you're glorified in our lives. Have your way this morning as we get into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So everybody gets a scenario. We've talked about this before. You know, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they're good friends of Jesus. Jesus hangs out at their house. He eats there. He stays there. Really, the place that Jesus goes to when he wants a break from everything that's going on is Bethany. I mean, that's where he goes when he wants to relax for a little bit. When he wants to get away from the crowds, let's go hang out at Mary and Martha's and Lazarus's house and we can just recoup for a couple days. That's, that's what he does there. And it's always an environment where he can do that. But this situation, Jesus is not at Bethany and he gets word that Lazarus is sick. And when he, when he hears that Lazarus is sick, you know, in a letter, what I can kind of see implied, and it doesn't say it, but in the letter, when we read in verse 3, the sister sent word to Jesus and said, Lord, the one you love is sick. What, what I kind of read into that is, it's a plea for you to come. We need you. We want you. The one you love is sick, and, and you need to be here with him for any number of reasons. Because I, I believe, deep down inside, both sisters know that if Jesus shows up, well, all he's got to do is speak the word, and that sickness is gone. They know that, they believe that, and I, and I think more than anything else, that's what they want is for Jesus to come. Now, imagine having that level of relationship where you can say to someone, I need you now, can you be there? I don't know that a lot of people experience that uh, in our culture today. You know, I don't know, I, I don't know that I would say we're a relational culture, at least not the way we were maybe 150 years ago or 100 years ago, or maybe even 70 years ago. I think we were more relational culture then than we are now. And the weird thing is, we've got more ways to be connected than we ever have before, but yet we seem more distant than we've ever been. I mean, growing up in this community 70 years ago, when, you know, when, when Wanda probably remembers a day, maybe Don and Shirley remember a day, it, when in the, the community of Buchanan, when there was sickness in the community, everybody knew about it. When there was a death in the community, everybody knew about it and came together. Maybe when there was a marriage in the community, everybody came together for it. That was, that was community life at one point in America. And, and truly, it was when there was sadness in the community, everyone mourned. When there was joy in the community, everyone rejoiced. That is the way it was. Now, even though we have the ability to be more connected together... We seem to be more disconnected than we ever have been before. You know, I always hear, and, and I've said over the last couple of years, I, I don't get what's going on with, like, kids and young people today. I don't, I don't get it. I don't claim to even be able to figure it out. Look, when I was 16 years old, when I was 13 years old, you remember even when you were 13, getting ready to go to high school, I think, at that age? You know that in a couple of years you're going to be driving a car. And when you're a guy at that age, you think, you know what? I'm growing up. I'm a man now. I can kind of make my own decisions. I can do my own thing. You guys remember that? You remember being at that age where you're like, I can't wait to get my license. And when I get my license, I can drive anywhere I want to go. Which, look, for me, in, in the early 1980s, Chillicothe was as far as I was ever going to go anyways driving. And so that was like, but that was like going to the other side of the world at that day and age. And, and I remember thinking, can't wait to get my wheels I didn't even have any wheels. I just wanted my license because I knew I was going to get to drive and I could go anywhere I wanted. And now I'm like, I, I, I meet kids that are in college that don't have their license. And that just strikes me as so odd. How, how do you get around? My mom and dad take me. I'm like, dude, I mean, when I was 13, my mom and dad didn't take me places. I rode my bike. Uh, so I don't get that. And, and so I'm just telling you, I don't in any way, shape, or form connect with young people today because they just, I don't know, I don't get it. So anyways, I, I said that to say, like, I, I wanted to grow up. What I thought at 13 is, man, the world is my oyster. Is that the right phrase? I can do anything I want to do, be anything I want to be. I just got to grow up, get, 
my mom and dad, they were so oppressive. And if I just get out from under dad's thumb, I'll be the man I want to be and live the way I want to live. And I had all these ideas. I'm going to grow up and do all these things. And the reality is that was silliness, but I was wanting to grow up because what I saw ahead of me was a life that I wanted to live. I don't know that young people grow up thinking, man, I can't wait to grow up and be an adult. It almost seems to me like there's this mentality that says, I don't want to be an adult. I know adults right now that don't want to be adults, oddly enough, which is so weird. But I don't want to grow up and be an I don't want to get my license. I don't want to have to drive. I don't have to vote. I don't have to do adult things. Can't you stay on your insurance till I'm 57? I mean, that's a, no. I mean, that, that's kind of the culture we live in. I don't get that. I'm just telling you. I am so disconnected from that reality. I, I don't get it. And and so what I see in our culture is this group of young people that are really, I don't know, they just don't have solid, healthy relationships where you got a dad who says, no, you're getting your license whether you want to drive or not. I mean, because that's where I was as a dad. Look, when my kids were growing up, I can't tell, how many, you have any idea how many trips we made back and forth to Pike when Gabe and Lex were growing up? I mean, it feels like millions and millions of trips to and from Piketon every day to football practice, to cheerleading practice, basketball practice, cheerleading practice, musical. But I mean, it just went on forever. And I couldn't wait till my kids were old enough to drive so I could say, drive yourself to practice. That's what I wanted. Uh, and, and my kids were both okay with that. They, they like, wanted to drive. Because really, look who wants mom and dad chauffeuring them around when you're 16 anyway. Isn't that something embarrassing? Did, did any of you ever have to go on a date where your mom, like, had to drive you? I, look, when, when you're a kid and you're going to homecoming, I'm just saying, when you're a freshman and you're going to homecoming, unless you're going with an upperclassman, how'd you get to the homecoming dance? Your mom or your, your dad's not going to do that, just so you know. It's going to be your mom. Mom's going to put you in the car. Go pick up your date and then drive you to the dance and then pick you up. I mean, that's borderline humiliating, right? You don't want to do that. I didn't want to do that anyways. Look, I'm just not even going into that story any deeper. I just wanted to drive. Let me tell you that. I wanted to get out, wanted to be my own man, do my own thing. And, and, and I don't see that today. And so even though we've got this culture where uh, we're relationally disconnected from each other. Mom, moms and dads disconnected from their kids in a weird way. Kids disconnected from their parents. And so parents and, and kids are disconnected, but yet they're so dependent upon one another, they can't function without each other, and yet there's really no relationship between them, and we don't build relationships with other people. I don't know that kids build relationships, strong relationships with other kids, uh, except on social media. And is that a relationship? No, it's not. I mean, I know you think it is, and I know some people are like, well, you know, my best friend lives in, you know, lives in, uh, oh, no, I got a better example. <laughs> the girl I'm dating, she lives in Africa, and as soon as I get enough money, I'm bringing her here. I mean, that's kind of relationships that exist in our world today, and we're like, well, that's, that's normal, right? No, it's not normal. I mean, look, I'm just telling you, Ron and I, she went to Pike, and I went to Waverly. That was a long-distance relationship in 1988, Okay. I, well, there were times I'm like, I don't know if this relationship can work. She lives across the river. How am I going to make that happen? So now it's like, yeah, my girlfriend or my boyfriend uh, is an oil worker in Africa, and as soon as I get $5,000, they're going to marry me, and I'm going to be a, a prince or a princess the rest of my life. I mean, that's, a, that's the attitude. That's not real. You know that, right? So even though we believe deep down inside, I got real relationships, we don't have real relationships. And so we've got no depth of relationship there's no personal connection and you end up on dr phil trying to get your life sorted out that's not normal i mean, just say it that's not normal not not digging dr phil it, it just it's just not normal i don't think but that's where we live in so i think we have relationship issues uh that we need to address i don't know that mary and martha have that imagine being in a relationship where you can say to someone really what you're feeling inside and not a lot of people get to do that and that's, so that's one of the things about being in a committed relationship when you're engaged, when you're married. You, you enter this level of relationship that's kind of different. And so really, I think it's in the engagement stage when you start really seeing who the other person really is. That's just my opinion. It may not be true. I'm just saying I think that's when, when you start seeing the real person. Because look, when you're in a dating relationship, 
and you're serious about dating someone, the goal is down the road, right? So you're putting on your best, your best foot forward when you're dating. Once you get that ring, ladies, it's kind of different there, right? Guys, once you put that ring on her finger, it's kind of different from that point on. Now you can be a little more real in who you are because eventually that's going to come out. For a lot of us, look, for a lot of us, the true reality didn't come out until we got married, right? That's when you realize all the cute things are really annoying. All the stuff you thought was cute when you're dating and when you're engaged, now it drives you crazy once you're married. Because, you, look, there were things probably about me that Rhonda didn't realize uh, until we got married. I, I'm guessing, I'm just guessing one of them is the whole toilet seat thing. I don't get why anybody would want to leave the toilet seat down. It makes no sense to me at all, okay? I'm just saying. But my wife grew up in a house of mostly women. She probably never knew you could put the toilet seat up for most of her life. And now we get married, and all of a sudden the toilet seat's in a different position, and it could be, could be a problem. could be a problem. I'm not saying it was for us. I'm saying it could be a problem. So now you got this stark reality. See what you're in for? Aren't you excited about this? So now you got this stark reality that is coming out. But in a, in a relationship, those are things you work through until you reach a point where, look, I would say things to Rhonda that I would never say to anyone else. Uh, or, or with my family. There are things I would say to them, not mean things, I'm just saying. I could say to Rhonda something that irritates me or you know, just pushes me to the extreme. I could say that to her and she's not going to pack her bags and leave because I told her how I felt about some particular issue in the world. She's not going to do that. That is the beauty of that relationship. So there is someone you can say anything to and the relationship is still okay. We're getting to that point with Mary and Martha as they're engaging with Jesus. So Jesus stays uh, two more days, and then finally in verse 7, and then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But they said, Rabbi, a short while ago there the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they will see by this, they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going to wake him. Now, when Jesus says he's fallen asleep, do you know what they think he means by that? He's, he's really asleep. As a matter of fact, the disciples said to him in verse 12, Well, that's good. If he, if he sleeps, he'll get better. So they're still kind of thinking, well, Lazarus is just really sick, needs a couple days rest. Once he gets his rest in, he's going to be okay. And so if he sleeps, he's good. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. Well, I get it. Because Jesus, you already said, this sickness is not unto death. So why in the world would they be thinking that he's dead? And that's when Jesus says to them in verse 14. Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I am glad that I was not there. That sounds kind of mean, right? I mean, look, uh, uh, he's dead and I'm glad I wasn't there for it. Well, no, that's not what relationship is. Relationship is you're there in the good times, you're there in the bad times. But it's what he adds after that that is critically important. He says, for I am gl I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. So that you may believe. I want you to believe. And this is going to be the event. And, and I've said before. The raising of Lazarus from, from the dead, I believe, is the pivotal event that sets in motion the crucifixion of Jesus. It's, it's the resurrection of Lazarus when the chief priests and everybody gets together and says, okay, we got to deal with this now. Everybody's going to believe. So we got to do something. So I think this event is pivotal for everyone involved, including the 12 disciples they're either going to believe or they're not going to believe. And so Jesus says, this is important. I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. Then Thomas, also called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may, that we may die with him. So anyways, up to this point is what I want you to see. This is a close 
group of people with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They are intimately connected. They are relationally connected with each other in a way that is different from a lot of other people. I mean, we know Jesus had close relationships with his 12, but in that group, Peter and James and John were kind of in the inner circle. Mary and Martha and Lazarus had this really deep, relational connection to Jesus that puts them kind of on a different level. I mean, there are very few people that are going to send word to Jesus and he goes. But Mary and Martha are in that group. There aren't a lot of people who who really will go to Jesus and say, do this, maybe even when he doesn't want to, and he doesn't. I mean, I'm thinking Mary, his mother, is probably on that list. But in addition to that, when you talk about close people, Mary and Martha Uh, The sisters of Lazarus, they're right up there too. And they're willing to ask of Jesus what maybe sometimes other people wouldn't want to ask of Jesus because of this relational connection that they have that we're calling engagement. And so engagement uh, for us with Jesus is that stage of relationship where there is an emotional and an intimate connection that moves beyond servanthood. See, a lot of times when we talk about our relationship with Jesus, we do so from a master-servant relationship. And that's true in Scripture. I mean, you see that. Uh, When I was saved, and I've talked before about when I was saved, I was saved for one reason. Does anybody remember the reason I was saved? I didn't want to go to hell. I was not in love with Jesus. I was not like, I want to be a servant of Jesus. I was at a point where I knew that if I died, I would be lost forever. That was it. There was no intimacy. There was no, hey, I want to connect. I thought church was kind of boring. I thought giving up a day and a couple hours a week was a bigger commitment than I wanted to make. So I I wasn't on board with a lot of that. Look, I love old hymns now. I was kind of bored singing hymns in church when I was growing up. Sung them my whole life. Knew them by heart. Didn't even need a hymnal anymore. When the song leader said, turn to page 387, I knew it was going to be victory in G. Just knew that. Didn't even need to look it up. So I wasn't really into any of that. So it wasn't like there was anything appealing in the church that pulled me in. I got saved because I was a sinner and for that reason alone. So when I got saved and I learned that Jesus was going to save me and I couldn't do anything to earn it, it made perfect sense in my mind that I should have to do something to kind of, I don't want to say pay back because, you know, I'm a good Protestant. I don't buy into that. So I don't want to say I felt obligated to pay back Jesus for my salvation, but there was something inside of me that says, if you're really going to be in this, you better get to work. And so naturally, I developed this idea that I'm a servant, I'm going to serve God, because how often do we hear that? You need to serve God, right? You've got to serve God. He wants to be a servant of Jesus, and, and, and it makes perfect sense. Jesus is the master, or we would say Jesus is Lord, I'm a subject. And that's all true. I don't want you to think that's not true. That's all true. But what we want to do is move beyond this understanding that says I'm a subject and I just got to do what I'm told to do. We want to move beyond I'm a servant and that's the only place I'm ever going to be. Because you're not just servants. I mean, you're servants, but you are joint heirs with Jesus. We're brothers and sisters. We talk about that. We're brothers and sisters in the faith. What we don't talk a lot about, I think because we're kind of weirded out by it, is the fact that God is Father. And I know we say our Father, I mean, uh, we get that, but do we really think of God more as Father or as Taskmaster? And I think sometimes we just have this natural tendency to think, Taskmaster, I got to please, rather than Father, who I can fall on my face and say, Father, I want this. It's different, and I think it's subconscious. I don't think we do it deliberately. I think we just naturally fall into that because of our relationship status. We're not really engaged. Or if we are engaged, we're engaged only at an academic level where we believe that service is what we got to do to keep our standing in the church. That's not what service is. I don't, look, so last night, watching a Hallmark movie, because that's what a good husband does on a Saturday night during football season, right? Yeah, I'm a good husband. I'm a good husband. Rhonda knows that. I have to remind her occasionally. So I get up. Rhonda made homemade bread. (laughs) 
This was absolutely the worst looking loaf of bread I've ever seen in my entire life. It was, wasn't it? Rhonda baked it. She didn't make it. She baked it. It was absolutely the ugliest, flattest loaf of bread I've ever seen. And Rhonda didn't make it. She got it from someone else to make who, uh, oh, never mind, I'm not going to say anything about that. So, watch the Hallmark movie. <laughs> Warm homemade bread comes out of the oven. You've got to get a piece immediately, right? I mean, it's, you don't wait on it to cool down. You cut it when it's hot. You put your butter on it, and you set down. So here I am on a Saturday night. Could I be watching a football game? Yeah, I could. I'm a good husband. I am watching a Hallmark movie eating a warm piece of homemade bread. That's what I'm doing. And so after, uh, after I got up, needed a break from the Hallmark movie. It's funny how I can watch three and a half hours of football and never move. Every 20 minutes during a Hallmark movie, i got to stretch my legs or something. So anyways, I get up, and I say, hey, you want me, you done with your plate? You want me to put it away? Normal thing, right? Actually, that's service for me. And I wanted to make sure that everybody heard that I served my wife last night. That's the only reason I said that. Uh, that's not the way relationships work, though, is it? I mean, I don't keep track of that, and I don't think my job is to serve Rhonda, and I hope Rhonda doesn't think her job is to serve me. I'm pretty sure she doesn't, but I want to make sure that, you know, that, that's not the nature of relationship. But yet, for some reason, uh, we are engaged in the church on this level that says, I got to serve or I'm not part of the family. I got to do something or I'm not worthy of salvation. No, that's not the way it works. So we want to move to this level of engagement with Jesus where we're more relationally focused than we are positionally focused. We're not thinking I'm a servant here to do a job. We're thinking I'm a son who belongs to the Father, and that Father loves me, loves me so much. I mean, that's what, that's what the Bible says. What manner, has, what manner of love has the Father lavished on us that we should be called the children of God? That's what we are, and that's what he says, and that's what we are. We're children who have a father that we can go to with anything we want. I mean, we just go to him and say, Father, this is what I need. And, and this is going to sound weird, but, I mean, wouldn't it be kind of weird to say, hey, Dad, I need some help? I mean, it would be weird for me. I'm just saying it would be very weird for me. But if, if I called my dad, that's exactly what I would say. Like, so let's say, I'm trying to think of something I called my dad for help with, just randomly. A uh, car breaks down. Hey, Dad, can you explain to me uh, what's happening here? Perfectly normal for a lot of people. But yet, when it comes to God, I feel this need to not say Dad because that just sounds weird and really think that initially when I make the request, I probably am not worthy of getting it. Anybody else like that? I mean, look, I can call my dad, my, my physical dad, call my dad with, with anything. If I, if I said, hey, Dad, I got a piece of flooring that's coming up, can't get it to stay down. Uh, what do you think? My dad would say, well, how about I come out tomorrow morning and look at it? I mean, that is the nature of a, a, a father-son relationship generally. But yet, and I expect that. But yet, when I go to God, my expectation is probably don't deserve it, and you're probably not going to do it because I'm not worthy of it anyways. That is a flawed understanding of who God is and what he does. That is a flawed understanding that we are subjects here to serve, and we're not really in the relationship we think we are. So Mary and Martha and Lazarus have this engagement with Jesus where they're willing to say stuff that other people probably would not say. And it shows up immediately in verse 17 when Jesus arrives outside of Bethany. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. So Martha immediately runs out to meet Jesus, and what is the very first thing that she says to him? Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Is that true? That is absolutely true. And Jesus knew that. But remember, what we're working towards is the glory of God, not anything else. And it is true that Jesus, had he showed up a couple days earlier, could have saved Lazarus from death, but that is not what God intended to do. Because the objective of everything in this account is God's glory. It's not 
getting Lazarus back to life, as important as what that may be for Mary and Martha. It is not the grief of two sisters, as important as what that would have been. The objective is for God to be glorified so that the people around him will believe who he is. That's it. There's no other purpose beyond that. And so Martha shows up and says, uh, Lord, uh, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But then in verse 22, and this is an incredible statement by Martha, but I know that even now God will give you what you ask. So if you just say the word, my brother will be healed. I mean, she gets that. Um, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now this, I'm just telling you, this shows, I think, the level of engagement that Martha and Mary have with Jesus. And, you know, Martha at this point is the one that, you know, is kind of doctrinally deep, at, at least from what I'm picking on, because Mary's the one that stayed behind. Now, in the other account of Mary and Martha, Martha is the one that is too busy to figure this stuff out, isn't she? I mean, Mary's the one learning at Jesus' feet, and Martha's the one that's so preoccupied with her serving that she doesn't even choose the most important thing, is what Jesus says. But I'm just, I'm just telling you, both of these ladies had a spiritual relationship with Jesus, and they got things, I'm guessing, I don't even know that Simon gets that at this point. So Martha says, uh, I know he will rise in the resurrection uh, at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And look at what Martha's response is. This is an incredibly powerful response. Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is come into the world. You are the Messiah. Now, last week we talked about, or a couple weeks ago, how Jesus, when he interacts with us, when, when we have an encounter with him, he is going to immediately move us to the real issue. We're not going to dabble in what our problem is. We're going to get to the core of where we are. Been there, done that with Mary and Martha. And they get that and understand that Jesus is more than just a guy who can raise the dead. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the anointed one who is going to be the Redeemer, not just of Israel, but of the whole world. That's depth of spiritual understanding that people don't get just in an academic concept. They get that in a present reality. They connect with it in a way that a lot of people don't. So, you know, when we, when we look at how Jesus and Mary and Martha interacted, I mean, I, and I should have to say this, but I'm going to say this. Uh, Jesus is fully engaged with them. Do you believe that? I mean, I think Jesus is fully connected with what's going on here. Uh, with, with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I mean, look at verse 33. So when, when, when Jesus, well, hold on, I'm coming to jump in the gun there. Let me, let me read some more scripture because I don't want to just skip over this. Um, in verse 28, after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here. And is asking for you. So she goes back and gets her sister and says, hey, the master's here and, and he wants to see you. So Mary just immediately leaves the house. There was a bunch of mourners there. And so uh, when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. Uh, when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, and what did she say? Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. This is a common refrain, and, and I've said before, I think everybody asks this question at some point in time, and we would ask it this way, you know, God, where were you when? Uh, or, God, why didn't you win? That's the way we ask the question. Now, we may not say that out loud. We may never vocalize it to anybody. But at some point in time, most everybody has been in that position spiritually where we've thought, God, if you would have done this, then X, Y, and Z wouldn't have happened. Just have no perspective on what God is doing. And so everybody's been there. Uh, Mary and Martha 
are, are there and say very clearly, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And again, that is a true statement to make. And this is how engaged Jesus is with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. When, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. So let me tell you how I would translate that. He is on the verge of crying if he's not already. He is just moved in his spirit and he's troubled. And, and he's troubled because Mary and Martha are troubled. That's why he's troubled in his spirit. So Jesus is fully engaged with Mary and Martha. And when they're upset, he's upset. When they're mourning, he's mourning. When they're weeping, guess what he's going to do in just a few minutes? He's going to be weeping as well. I want you to know this morning that Jesus is fully committed to being engaged in your life. I mean, God wants to be with you. So much so that when Jesus was born, we were going to call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God didn't look at the world and say, you rebellious sinners, you need to jump through hoops to get back to me. God looked at a world in rebellion and said, I, I feel sorry for my people that have sinned. I'm going to make a way in which they can come to me because they lack the ability to do that. God is engaged with the world. That's why he sent his only son into the world so that anyone who believes on him doesn't have to perish but can have eternal life. God is engaged with us in an intimate way. But we're not always engaged with him that way. And so uh, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled and said, Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then what does it say in verse 35? Jesus what? Wept. So he goes to the tomb of Lazarus and he stands there and cries. Knowing full well that like, Hold on, let me see what he says, just make sure I got it right. I know the Carmen song, but I, but I want to make sure I quote it right from the Bible. Um, he says, Lazarus, come forth, right? Lazarus, come forth. Okay, just want to make sure. Uh, so Jesus standing at the tomb in verse 35, verse 30, yeah, verse 35, Jesus standing there crying, knowing that in a minute, three words are going to change everything and that Lazarus is going to come out of the tomb. Why in the world do you stand there and cry if you know that he's coming back to life? Well, that's how, look, that's how engaged God is with us. Uh, when we weep, he weeps. When we hurt, he hurts. So it, it, we act as if uh, God doesn't get what's going on in our lives. That God is disconnected from us and that when we go through suffering, when we go through trials, when we deal with pain, we think God's somehow distant and not paying any attention. Nothing is further from the truth. He's connected with us. He's engaged on a level where he experiences what we experience. And look, we can't even get that as, as parents. You know, you parents, when you've raised kids, you know, when, when your kid gets heartbroken, you're kind of heartbroken, right? When your kid gets hurt, you're, you hurt as well. Maybe, maybe different levels, but, you know, when our kids fail, it hurts us when they fail. When they succeed, we rejoice when they succeed. So we don't even get that because we can never fully understand what someone personally experiences when they go through something. Everyone's different, but God can. So there's never a feeling. There's never a situation I've been in where I've been uh, worried or upset or angry or happy that God cannot exactly identify with in my life. No one else can, but God can. God is fully engaged with us to the extent that he comes into our situation, whenever that may be, and he personally gets involved. That's what so many people in the church, I think, miss today, is this personal involvement that Jesus, when he comes into our life, he doesn't, wanna, he doesn't want us to show up a Sunday, throw a little money in the offering plate, and be good for a week. He wants... He wants engagement from us where we're committed to him at a whole different level than where we had been. And this is why when we started this weeks ago, so many people in the crowd never really connect with Jesus. They're just in the crowd. They're enjoying some of the benefits that kind of drift out their way. But there's no relationship. There's no depth of relationship. There's no engagement on a level where they are confident 
like Mary and Martha are, that, Lord, I know right now whatever you ask will happen. There's no, there's no connection at that level that we would call engagement. And so Jesus is weeping outside the tomb. And the Jews, again, this just indicates how close they are. The Jews said, see how he loved him? I mean, that is that engagement between Jesus and Lazarus. Look at how much he loved him. But some of them said, and these are the people that really God wants to get their attention. Look, Mary and Martha are fully committed at this point. They know who Jesus is. They know what Jesus has the ability to do. They know that someday when they die, or if they don't die, Lazarus is going to be resurrected. They get that. But there are a lot of people around here that do not get that. And it's those people around that said, Could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? And the answer to that is, yes, he could have, but there's a bigger purpose going on in the background. Then in verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved. As he came to the tomb. So again, he's troubled in his spirit. Just grief. And all the things that Mary and Martha are experiencing, he is experiencing now too. Um, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across its entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time he stinks, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, look at what he says to Martha. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Martha, you got to believe. Because if you can believe, you will see the glory of God. So they took the stone away. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. And when he had said this, he called in a loud voice. I hear Carmen. Anybody know the song by Carmen? Lazarus, come forth. We should have played that. That would have been a good time for just to echo out, wouldn't it? Lazarus, come forth, is what Jesus says. And I don't say it like Carmen does in the song. Uh, Lazarus, come forth. The dead man came out with his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Then Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. And Lazarus is restored to life. Now, I really think it would be cool to find out what happens after this point. I mean, anybody else like... Okay, so what does Lazarus do? How long did he live? Did he have any kids? What's going on here? Whole rest of the story I'd like to know about, but we don't have the rest of the story. What we know is that Lazarus, who was dead, was raised to life, becoming a precursor to what Jesus is going to do a very short time later, which is die and then raise to life. And he did that specifically for us. So, so let's talk about what, it, what, it, what engagement looks like. You know, because what, what, what I want is this relationship where I am engaged with Jesus. And by engagement, I don't mean like we had this formal ceremony and now I'm going to be his forever. What I'm talking about is I'm just getting connected to Jesus in a relational way where my interactions with him are different than what they had been previously or maybe different than even the people around me. I can say to Jesus what I maybe I'm afraid to say to Jesus. I can talk with him. Not as if I'm unworthy, but as if I know who he is and whatever I ask, he's going to do. Because that's what Jesus said he would do. And I know we get hung up on that. I know we get hung up on you know, an opening to scripture that says, ask whatever you want in my name and I'll do it. We get hung up on that, but, but that's what it says. And there's no qualifier that says, well, yeah, but if, then. I mean, there's no, none of that. And look, just so you know, yes. I mean, Danny talked about the song we sang this morning. Look, I am one-fifth Pentecostal, just so you know. So I got no objections to that. I got no objections to the, hey, ask God for it, he's going to give it to you. Because I'm one-fifth Pentecostal, and I'm okay with that. So, look, I, I think we need to get beyond this hang-up where we can go to God and say, God, I, I'm upset right now, and this is what I want. Or we can go to God and say, God, I'm on, I'm on fire right now, this is what I want. Or we can go to God and say, God, I'm good with everything. Don't need anything, just want to hang out for a little bit and talk to you and see what's going on. That's the level of engagement we're talking about, where we're not a soldier just blindly following orders, but we're relationally connected to Jesus, where we just exist in his presence. Because when we exist in his presence, that's when we begin to understand that what he does is for his glory, not ours. I mean, look, it's not like God says, you know, Brian, you know what would be awesome for my glory? 
I'm going to make you a quarterback in the NFL. And at five foot seven, uh, 165, 170 pounds, you are going to lead the Bengals to a Super Bowl when Joe Burrow gets hurt. Now, how awesome would that be like for the glory of God or what? It would be miraculous, supernatural. And then I would say at the end of the Super Bowl, I just want to thank my Lord and Savior for this big victory because he gave me all this awesome talent. That's kind of the way it would go, right? That's, that's not for his glory. I mean, it's not. Uh, so this is what get, So when you get to this level, this is how you understand God working. So if you remember last week when we looked at Peter, uh, what Jesus said to Peter. So what was Peter's profession? What did he do? Fisherman, right? He knows it. He gets it. So it's not like Jesus said, hey, Peter, you're a fisherman. I want to turn you into something completely different and make you do this. No, you know what he did? He used Peter's ability to fit into God's purpose. Peter, you're a fisherman. From now on, you're going to catch men. Makes perfect sense. We have this idea that God's just going to come in and just radically throw everything out the window. And now I'm going to have to be a missionary when I'm really an IT guy. That's not what God does. God comes into your life. When you get, when you get engaged with Jesus, what you see is that he wants to use your life wherever it is for his glory. If you're an IT person, that's okay. If you're retired, that's okay. Wherever you're at, that's where God wants to use you for his glory. You have to go do something different. You just have to be available to be used. And that's what he did with Peter. So engagement, uh, when I'm fully engaged with Jesus, it cultivates my gifts and abilities so that God gets the glory in my life, not me. See, a lot of us in America are so self-focused that most of what we do is about us. It's about us getting the glory. Now, maybe we don't want like, you know, we don't want our name to be on TV because we did something great. When I say we want to get the glory, we want to get the glory from our boss so we get a nice raise. That's the kind of glory we're looking for. Or we want to get the glory of a new job so we can get more money. I mean, that's, that's where we're focused. Our lives, because they're centered on us, don't reflect the glory of God. They reflect the glory of us in the way we live, in the way we act, in what we wear, in what we drive, in where we go, and what we do. It reflects our glory, not God's. Well, when you get relationally engaged with Jesus, he wants to change that so your life reflects the glory of God in everything you do. And what you do, you do for his glory. But you're still you, and you're still working, and you're still living your life. You just do it for God's glory. See, I think we misunderstand that. I wish we're out, we're out of time. Well, we are really out of time. Is it really 1126? Is it 1126? Did we start at 11? We started at 10. Huh, that's funny how that happens. We're out of time. Look, I'm just telling you, I'd like to flesh that out a little bit more. Because God wants to use your gifts, your abilities, your job, your life right now for his glory. It doesn't mean you've got to change jobs or find new friends or anything like that. It means God wants to use you right now for his glory. Don't do anything different except glorify him. He cultivates your gifts and ability to accomplish that purpose. Two more, then I promise I'll let you go. Uh, relational engagement with God gives me purpose I can't find anywhere else. And man, I, I want to talk about this for another half hour. It's got to be a different sermon. We, because we're dysfunctional in our relationships in America today, we, it's because we don't understand what our purpose is. See, we have raised a generation of kids to believe their purpose is, get, we've raised probably two generations of kids at this point. Your, your, your only purpose in life, get a good job so you can make lots of money. That's the way we've raised our young people. We've raised them to believe that the only good thing in life is a comfortable existence and a good job. So you can live out all your, act, all, you can have a good personal life and social life and you can have a nice house and you can have a nice car and you can, have, you can be the image of what everybody thinks you should be and that's a facade and it's foolishness. That's the way we've raised young people for multiple generations now and it's no wonder they're unhappy with life because you cannot and will not find happiness and contentment in this world. So apart from Jesus, you have no purpose in life. Or I shouldn't say that. Apart from Jesus, your purpose is to make as much money as you can and live as much as you want. What other purpose is there? Look, I've said before, if I'm not a Christian, I am not here today wasting my time in a church. 
If I'm not a Christian, then I am out living as much pleasure as I can get because at 53, mine's winded down, right? I mean, look, at 53 years old, I have a lot of pleasure left to get in this world, and I better be making the most of every opportunity. I'm not going to waste my time on a guilty conscience and coming to church. I'm not going to do it, because why would I? Look, if I'm not going to be engaged with Jesus and believe that He gives me purpose, I'm not here today, because i got something better to do. But the reality is, we can only find our purpose in Jesus uh, in, in, John, uh, in John chapter 1, I'm not going to read it, I'll just tell you, in John chapter 1, uh, Jesus calls Philip and Nathaniel, so it's, or Nathaniel, Nathaniel, uh, and so Philip comes to Jesus first, I believe, is it Philip first? And so when Philip meets Jesus, he goes back, and yeah, thank you Kai, so he goes back and find Nathan, finds Nathaniel, his buddy, and says, hey, uh, we, we found the Messiah, come and see him, and you know, uh, Nathaniel says something to the effect of, really, he, uh, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Is that what he says? Yeah, can any, can any good thing come out of, uh, of Nazareth? And so then when Nathaniel finally meets Jesus, Jesus says to him, Oh, behold, an Israelite in whom indeed there is no guile. And Nathaniel believed him. And Jesus says, you believed it because I said that? Well, you're going to see greater things than this. So there is this interaction with Nathaniel, where Jesus says to Nathaniel, yeah, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. I've got a purpose for you that is greater than me seeing you under a fig tree when Philip told you who I was. Yeah, I saw that. I didn't miss that. And if you think that's, you think that's big, you haven't seen anything yet. You don't know what I'm going to do with you. See, our purpose is derived from Christ and Christ alone. Or I could go back even farther and, and go to the book of Genesis, and I'm not going to do that. Look, we were created. I don't care what the world tells you. I don't care what, what, what everybody says. You were created by God and for God. Your purpose apart from Him, there is none. That's one of the issues we have today. Again, we we'll need to talk about that more, but we can't now. And, and so being engaged with Jesus causes your faith to be expressed in a real way in the real world. Now, Paul would say it this way in Galatians 2.20. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. Our, our lives should be lived every day. So being engaged with Jesus, Jesus brings the completeness of my faith which should be exhibited every day of my life. Look, I said before, I'm an IT guy. Everybody knows I'm an IT guy. I fix computers. I actually teach how to fix computers now, but neither here nor there. Uh, my job is to fix computers. Can God be glorified in fixing computers? The answer is, yes, he can. He can be. You just have to figure out how to do it that way. Can God be glorified in everything we do? The answer is, yes, he can. And it all depends on how we're willing to let our faith shape our everyday lives. Most people in the crowd fall into this mindset that, well, faith is good for Sunday, but it has no bearing on Monday. And I would say your faith has as much bearing on Monday, if not more, than it did on Sunday. Your faith is going to determine how you interact with your boss. It's going to determine how you interact with your coworkers. It's going to determine how you interact with your community. And they're either going to see your faith as genuine or they'll see it as a fraud. That's on you. So as I engage with Jesus, as I get engaged with Jesus, what I find out is that my faith becomes an expression, not of who I am, but of who he is in, our, in my everyday life. And that's what we need to be shooting for every day. My life, if I'm engaged with Jesus, my faith becomes an expression of who he is on my job, in my home, and in my community. And that's where people see the reality of the gospel when we get to that point. Stand with me and bow your heads.